Uh, my name's Rob Abel, and I want to welcome you to the uh, Learning Impact Leadership Institute for 2018. This is our 12th Learning Impact event. We have record attendance again. That's wonderful. Thank you so much all for coming and spending some time with us. Uh, we have worked really hard to put together a very, very compelling program uh, for all of you to participate in over the next three days, so we hope you enjoy it. And uh, right now, we want to uh, thank a few people. And the way we do the thank a few people in IMS is that if you see the logo of your organization or if you see some activity that you're involved in in IMS, we want you to stand up. It's only going to be for a minute or so, but we want you to stand up. We want you to stay standing until the end when we all clap. How does that sound? Can you guys ready for that? Can you handle that? I know it's early, but hopefully you're awake. All right, so let's start with our sponsors. First of all, our diamond sponsors. Anyone that's a member of the diamond sponsor organization, please stand up. Very good. Our platinum sponsors and gold sponsors, please, no, stay standing. Stand up and stay standing, please. Platinum and gold sponsor, please stand up and stay standing. Our silver sponsors and bronze sponsors, please stand up and stay, everyone stay standing. Thank you all for your leadership. Any of our industry partners that are in the room, if you see your logo up on this page anywhere, please stand up and be recognized. Any of the industry partners and everyone stay standing. Any of our IMS leadership activities, leadership the, participating in any of the IMS leadership activities, any of the IMS work groups, please stand up. Please stand up and everyone stay standing. And finally, if you're an IMS member, if you're especially one of our regional groups, IMS Europe, IMS Korea, IMS Japan, please stand up, please stand up. And now I'd like everybody to stand up and recognize the people with, who without we couldn't have done any of this, and this is the IMS staff. Lisa Matson, Colin Smythe, Tracy Fandel, Mark McCall, Sandra DeCastro, Mark Luba, Sam Burke, Tara Jenkins, Marcus Gilling, Jill Hobson, Jeff Bohr, Mark Ramon, Karen Dottery, Kevin Lewis, Derek Haskins, Matt Pasowitz, James Rissler, and finally, Phil Nichols. Thank you all for your, so, so much for your leadership. We really appreciate it. You can sit down now. <laughs> All right, I hope everybody's awake now. Oh my gosh, there's an audience. All right, so uh, here we are in Baltimore, and I'm glad we're in Baltimore because it gives me a chance to talk about one of my favorite sports legends. He's uh, actually pictured in the back row of this photograph in the middle. Uh, he started out his career in Baltimore as a pitcher in baseball and he went to the Red Sox and he was a darn good pitcher. Matter of fact, he set some records as a pitcher that weren't broken for another 40 years. And it, but most people know him because he was a great hitter, a great slugger, and of course we're talking about who? Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, right. So everybody knows, everybody knows about the Babe. He was a great hitter. He had a larger than life personality, right? Um, but most people don't really, really realize how great he actually was how great he actually was. What this little table up here is showing how many home runs the Babe hit, and then how many other teams he hit more home runs than by himself. <laughs> so in 1920, he hit more home runs than 14 of the 16 teams in Major League Baseball. And literally, Babe was a 10X. He hit more home runs by himself than most teams. He was a 10X, and he truly changed the game. Over the course of Babe Ruth's career, baseball changed from one type of game to another type of game. So, in my opening remarks here, uh, in honor of the Babe, uh, we're going to be showing some quotes that we collected from the IMS membership 
that talk about how they're using IMS standards to really scale uh, implementations of EdTech. And these were collected from the members and we're basically just showing some of the best ones that we got. I'm sure there are a lot more out there, but we're showing the best ones. So as an example, Unison is actually collecting data from 25 universities serving nearly one million students. One million students. Okay, so it's been a very busy year in IMS. Uh, we, we gave you our annual report in your conference materials. Please look through that. But we were very busy. We had seven meetings around the world that IMS hosted. We participated in some 60 panels and presentations at other conferences during the year. Um, but it was at this particular meeting, which was in England toward the, toward the end of last year, where I think we got the quote of the year. And the quote of the year came from our own Mark Luba, who you can see sitting there very relaxed. And Mark said something along the lines, uh, something like this, I believe, Mark. I've been told that standards are decidedly non-sexy. Did you say something like that? He said something like that, right? But I want to remind all of you that if it wasn't for really good interoperability, none of us would actually be here. It seems like only three people got that, so I'm a little bit concerned. I'm a little bit concerned. I'm not sure what that means for the audience. All right, so in my intro time here, I'm going to uh, kind of talk about seven things that I think characterize what IMS has become through your leadership, right? IMS is a membership organization. You've been leading it. I want to talk about seven things that IMS has become. And the first one is this topic of advancing personalized learning for educational improvement. Let me explain. This is kind of the overarching goal of IMS. This is why we exist. Many of you are familiar with the different paradigms around personalized learning, individualized learning, adaptive learning, and so forth. This is, concept has been around for a while. This particular picture came from Boston Consulting Group from 2011. I think we're all familiar with this idea. And basically, this is the role that technology can play in learning. Personalized learning, making learning better. And I think we all agree with that. It's part of the IMS mission. But when I think of personalized learning for educational improvement, I kind of think of it as two pieces. One piece is that individual piece, that learner piece, helping the learner develop their own agency use their learning experiences to um, uh, apply to new opportunities. But I also think of the institutional perspective or the perspective of how do you improve the process of education? How do you improve the process of education? So th these are things that institutions care about or in more informal settings, just educators care about. Student success, competitiveness, distinctiveness, and so forth. And I really think in IMS, we're coupling these things, two things together to really help create the future of education. Second thing I wanted to talk about is defining and enabling ed tech and business and innovation ecosystem. So ecosystem is a very popular word nowadays. Everyone's using the term ecosystem. Well, I think in IMS, we're, we're actually defining an ecosystem. We're defining what an ecosystem actually is. I like to use this map paradigm to talk about ecosystem. This is a map from the second century. This is a map of the world in the second century from the perspective of Greece and the Greek society. As you can see, it's pretty limited. It's a pretty limited view of the world. You've got Europe there, and you've got a little bit into Asia and so forth. Now, what was the purpose of this map? Well, was it to kind of say, well, you know, honey, we got some time off. Let's look at the map and see where we're going to go on vacation or something like that. No, it was more like Amazon.com, actually. <laughs> it was about. Trading partners and trading routes. It was like, how do we get stuff? How do we get the stuff that we need? So when I apply this model to, to EdTech in the EdTech ecosystem, I think of the destinations as the product categories, the, the current product categories, the emerging product cat categories, and the interoperability required to connect those product categories together for a productive user experience. Now let's just talk very briefly about the motivation. The motivation both then and now, is commerce. That's the primary motivation. We're basically trying to create commerce. Most of us in this room are some way in order either buying stuff or selling stuff. Let's face it. But what's the overarching larger goal? It's this, personalized learning, educational improvement. So it's very important to keep that in mind as we go forward here. Now, we're talking about a very specific kind of ecosystem in IMS. It's called a business ecosystem. 
It's not a biological ecosystem of amoebas and stuff like that. It's a business ecosystem which has three characteristics. One is there's a network of organizations that are working together. The second one is that they're sharing a common technological platform. And the third one is that they have shared risk in that platform. They either all succeed or all fail together. It's very important to have those three things to actually have an ecosystem. So what is our eco ecosystem platform? It's standards. It's standards. IMS is not building a platform. We're basically creating standards that are at the core of the ecosystem, and most of you or all of you are familiar with these standards. So essentially what these standards become in terms of our map paradigm is they become the information pathways between different types of products to achieve certain uh, types of goals in terms of either IT integration or improving educational experiences and hopefully both. So another quote here, these are just some of the uh, testing stats from IMS for 2017. You can see them yourself, pretty impressive. These are using our test systems in IMS uh, for standards. Vital source. 1,000 LTI integrations, nearly 56 million LTI launches in 2017. 56 million. Okay, the third thing I want to talk about is advancing pivotal transformation technologies. So this is a map in, in 1490 of your, you know, from the European perspective. And as you can see, it's a little bigger. It's a little more filled out than the previous map. This is the map about 40 years later. It's empty. Half of it is empty. <laughs> Half of the world map is empty, right? And the point I'm trying to make here is that we're just in the beginning of the ed tech revolution. We're in the very beginning. There are going to be many more innovations. There are going to be many more endpoints in our map than we can even conceptualize at this point in time. So it's very, very important to do interoperability well to be in the middle of those innovations. So IMS has five focus categories. You can see them on our website. You can see them in the annual report. But these are the areas that we're hunkered down on because we believe that we need to help invent these categories. Not just see them happen, but invent them. Be right in the middle of the development of these categories. And this set of categories will, will evolve, just like the map is going to evolve in the future. But we see IMS as an organization that has to be involved in those endpoints in order to do the interoperability piece well. And also, to get to the future in defining that map, we need research. We need research. So how do you do research? Well, you can use the interoperability standards to do research. That's the, that's the point. We're designing the interoperability standards so that we can understand what's getting transacted via these products and what's useful and what isn't useful and how we create seamless experiences for users and understand the usage of products as well as the efficacy of products. And as a community, this is very, very important for IMS, for the future of IMS and for the future of this whole ed tech industry. Because as we all know, educators and institutions want proof. They want proof that we're improving education with our products. QTI, very impressive. 28,000 items delivered and scored per minute using QTI. 28,000 per minute. 172 million caliper events per month. This is big scale stuff, right? <laughs> Purdue, 32,000 students, collecting data from 32,000 students. Pretty impressive scale with some of these IMS standards. Now I want to talk about the actual core interoperability standards themselves. Um, this, of course, is the part that most people think IMS does, which, of course, we do. We do a very good job of this. But here's where I'm going to talk about some of the announcements that have come out this week. So hopefully, at least briefly touch on them. You're probably going to have to read the press releases and so forth to really understand them in depth. But quote about LTI, Cengage, 78 titles for LTI deep linking already so far this year. So you're guessing that the first announcement I'm going to talk about is LTI Advantage. We announced today that we're making great progress on the LTI Advantage early adopter program. We have 19 leading product companies involved. We also have an endorsement letter um, that's co-developed by suppliers and institutional members in higher ed to really uh, explain 
why it is so important to have a common integration platform. And this LTI Advantage, we'll see, it'll be interesting a year from now where we are with LTI Advantage, but uh, this is a very, very important uh, specification for the EdTech ecosystem. One roster, clever, 1,600 schools every day process one roster files. Another McGraw-Hill, 240 districts. One roster is used in 240 districts today by McGraw-Hill. So I guess you're guessing that the next announcement is about one roster. So yesterday, we announced a very, very new initiative called One EdTech. And this, this initiative was uh, created and founded by the IMS Board of Directors. And the reason it was created was because a set of leading publishers came to IMS and basically said, we're all in on one roster. We're all in. I mean, we want one roster to be the de facto standard, and we want to break down any barriers that we have to to make sure that students and teachers can what? Be digital on day one. They can have seamless access to our products, and there are minimal issues associated with getting that to happen. So essentially, it's an adoption initiative, and what's happening with one roster right now is there's a set of content suppliers. It's very early, it just started, and there's a set of districts we're working with basically to figure out how we take the great progress we've made so far with one roster and take it to the next level so that it's even that much easier to adopt because everyone knows that zero is Rob's favorite number. Zero time and cost integration, zero. And I do mean zero. I don't mean zero plus something, I mean zero. <laughs> it's learning. 2,000 thin common cartridges. So a thin common cartridge is kind of a breakthrough because it basically makes the ability to have searchable learning objects very, you know, widely available. And probably 2,000 thin common cartridges is probably roughly 10 million learning objects, approximately. There's no way to know for sure because they're all different sizes and so forth. But what do you need to make those learning objects from probably, you know, I don't know how many different suppliers, but it's probably 50, 60, 70, maybe 100 different suppliers. What do you need to make those learning objects productive? Alignment. You need alignment. You need to be able to align different objects from different suppliers to a common set of learning standards and competencies. And that includes content or assessments as well as, well as uh, content. So uh, basically what we, and we developed IMS over the last two years, this great standard called CASE, Competency and Academic Standards Exchange, which is basically a way, a standardized way to represent learning objectives, competencies, including state learning standards, so that now they can be exchanged and mapped and so forth in a digital fashion. And we decided this is kind of a chicken and the egg sort of problem, and the IMS board decided that to really help accelerate this whole initiative, we're gonna actually create and host a free 50-state registry of K-12 standards, publicly available, freely usable by anyone, and supported into the distant future as far as it needs to be supported. But in addition to this, the IMS members are signing up to add additional types of products to this, like crosswalks and so forth, that will make it even more powerful. So we're really trying to break the logjam that we've had around this being a blocker to adoption of large-scale digital products, right? So that's another major announcement that came out yesterday. And finally, we're gonna talk about a little bit about open badges, because I know for a lot of you that's your favorite topic, right? Badges, digital credentials, one million. One million badges, IBM, 1, 150,000 per quarter. So one of the most important announcements we've made, probably ever in the history of IMS, in its 20-year history, was made in February. It was made at our February meeting, and it was about this. It was about the availability of Open Badges 2.0. And not only that, but the adoption of Open Badges 2.0 by the leading badging platform. This is a complete breakthrough. It's hard to tell now, I know, but this is like the advent of the LMS 20 years ago, in my humble opinion. These products and this specification are going to be so important because they allow st students, learners, to have agency in terms of their own digital micro-credentials, in terms of their own learning, to actually exchange those in an interoperable way 
that isn't centralized. So this is a stream breakthrough, I feel, and it's going to be very, very important. That was February. OK. So now we're kind of talk about how. We kind of talked about the what we do. So how do we do it? Well, we're kind of inventing a new generation of leaders. What's new about them? They work across boundaries. They work across boundaries. So, you know, you look at something like the Next Generation Digital Learning Initiative from Educause, IMS was right in the middle of that, right in the middle of that. And this um, issue of Educause Review in the summer, every article mentioned IMS and was written by someone closely associated with the IMS community. That's pretty substantial, right? Because this is a mainstream IT magazine, right? This is not a magazine about standards, right? But that just shows you how IMS gets in the middle. But then, of course, just as equally important, IMS is getting in the middle of defining what do we actually mean by ecosystem. Because let's face it, we don't actually really know exactly. But IMS is leading that discussion, and that's very, very important. But how do we work across boundaries? Well, we work across the traditional curriculum, instruction, IT boundaries. We work across the subsector boundaries of K-12, higher ed, and lifelong. We've had incredible examples of specification work, work being starting in one, going to the other, in some cases even bouncing back then to the other sector and getting approved all the way. We, of course, have this great collaboration between institutions and suppliers. I cannot tell you how many times people tell me, well, IMS is like the only place I, I go where suppliers and institutions are actually working together. And of course, how are we going to make ed tech, the future of ed tech, happen if we don't actually have suppliers and institutions working together? I don't know how we would do it. But then, of course, we've got this great global collaboration as well, which is very, very powerful. And some of the IMS standards, particularly QTI, but many of them, some of that best work comes from other parts of the world, Europe. In the, in the case of QTI. Look at the statistics here on QTI in Europe. So a lot of what's happening in the US is also starting to happen in other parts of the world. So the sixth thing I want to talk about is what I call our committed collaboration. I don't mean like committed like to like a health institution or something like that. I mean, I mean actually, actually committed a collaboration where there is commitment. Not just a collaboration where we walk in a room, we talk, and then we walk out, and we don't have really any commitment to each other, <laughs> but really commitment. And um, IMS has, is doing well in terms of our community. It's really, for me, difficult to fathom, because 12 years ago, I think we might have had 100 people collaborating or something like that. I don't know what it was. Lisa probably knows what it was. We've got 3,600 people collaborating through the IMS community now. In one year, IMS facilitates roughly 500 meetings. 500, meaning, the, meaning work group meetings, meetings where work actually gets done. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty large scale. And this all gets to critical mass. You've got to have critical mass if you want to move the market around standards. It's the only way. A good standard by itself will not move the marketplace. One example is University of Kentucky, where they're integrating with 22, diff 22 different systems. Many of those systems are not IMS members. But the IMS market pull is so strong that those other organizations are, of course, implementing IMS standards, even though they're not members. And this year, we're uh, actually at this conference for the first time talking about a new type of partnership with uh, venture capital organizations. And we're starting with New Markets Venture uh, Capital, or New Markets Partner Venture Partners, who uh, you'll actually see during this conference will be conducting some panels. But this is a way for IMS to get involved with some of the up and coming companies in the space. It's a new partner type of partnership. And finally, I wanted to talk about focused investment partnership. So what IMS has become over the last 12 years is really kind of a force multiplier in terms of your ideas and how to create interoperability standards and ecosystem. This is all in the annual report that we, we gave you. But the significant thing about this, other than the growth, the growth has been amazing. The growth has been 9x in 12 years. And it wasn't from a small base for a standards organization. At the time, 12 years ago, we were already the largest standards organization in the, ed in the education space. 
And since that point in time, we've grown 9x. And most of the other standards organizations have shrunk, have shrunk. They haven't actually grown at all. They've actually shrunk. So the interesting thing about this, though, is that because of that committed partnership, because we're all essentially investing in the same thing, interoperability, there's incredible return on investment here. So if IMS is investing $5 million of revenue every year, I guarantee you that that's a very, very small percentage, maybe 10% or 5% of the actual spend across all of the members on IMS. So we're looking at probably a 50 to $100 million kind of investment every year in what IMS is doing. It's a contractually committed investment. It's a membership model. And we're all basically, may not be working exactly on the same thing, but we're all working towards this interoperable ecosystem. And that's, that's very powerful. And the membership model makes sure that we are responding to the sector. We're responding to the sector. We're responding to suppliers, K-12 institutions, higher education institutions, and so forth. And so why do they do it? Why do they join? Because the ROI is great. The return on investment is very, very good. Basically, this enables institutions to do things that probably otherwise they just couldn't do. Or if they did it, it would cost them 100 times more than it's actually costing them to do it based, based on the IMS uh, standards and the I, essentially the IMS network of organizations that are all working together. So I call this now the IMS ethos. <laughs> the, I, the IMS ethos, the overarching goal, advancing personalized learning for educational improvement. The what we do, defining the enabling ed tech ecosystem, advancing pivotal educational technologies, and developing the standards-based ecosystem platform. The how. Fostering a new generation of leadership that works across boundaries. Catalyzing a committed collaboration and focusing community investment towards a common goal. And I just wanted to leave you this morning um, with I think a very, very obvious point that despite all the discussions we have, I don't really see us discussing it very, very much. And I think that obvious point is that when you look at the members of IMS, we're leaders in the education space, we understand that for education to get where it needs to get, we need significant advancement in terms of what we're doing. We need to get a lot better, not just in meeting the needs of today, but certainly in meeting the needs of tomorrow. And we all know that. That's one of the reasons why we're here, right? So then the question is, well, how do you actually get better? How do you get better? Well, we have a lot of really great associations where people talk to each other and they exchange ideas, and that's wonderful. But what IMS has become is something a little bit different. IMS is something where we're actually building stuff. We're building stuff together that will help us both improve costs, but also enable greater innovation. And, I, and in my own personal opinion and why I'm here in IMS is I believe we need more collaborations like this in the education space that are essentially force multipliers where we actually work together because let's face it, you know, we kind of have two options. We can all do, you know, the same thing independently or we can all do the same thing together. And I think it's pretty obvious that if we all do the same thing together, and if we can figure out what those same things are, that's a very, very powerful collaboration. And I think that's what IMS has become, an organization where we can do that. And you might ask me, well, where will IMS go in the future? Well, it's up to you. You're the IMS members. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.